thank you to the organizers uh, to, to be invited here to speak about uh, things which you all know and which you will certainly consider to be uh, Not a pointer. Oh, wonderful. Uh, trivial at the end, <laughs> but maybe diffuse, confusing. And so I will go into the subject with slides and with some formula on the blackboard. And I also will give some references at the end. And so if anybody wants to get a copy of the slides, you can get them with references too. They will be on the website. Oh, the wonderful. Site. OK, so the um, problem which I want to address is whether quantum mechanics has something to do with higher brain functions. And that was the subject of an article which Christoph Koch and I wrote in for Nature. And uh, Nature was very far-sighted. We had a question mark at the end. And that was, of course, completely wrong because quantum mechanics is very important for the brain. I mean, the whole matter is quantum mechanical. And so I'm happy to, to have as a subject two things. One is I want to give first a short view on classical electrodynamics of a brain, of a classical brain, so that you can see about what we are speaking. And that's, of course, the brains which we have inside ourselves. And you will recognize some of those things. But uh, there are two things in our article which uh, we dis addressed very pointedly. And that was that the quantum mechanics in the brain for higher brain functions is ridiculous because there are no sensible or interesting quantum computations, algorithms, known which such a quantum computer, the brain, could use. And I think that since the writing of this paper, no really good quantum algorithms have been found. And maybe we'll never find anything which could possibly implement interesting computations in the brain. Uh, the second thing is, in our article, we uh, addressed a more physical question. The, it is hopeless to have higher brain functions implemented in the brain because the brain is extremely coherent as a wet and warm engine. And uh, I, I think it's good to address to you um, one well-known formula is if you have a free particle, so h equals to p squared over 2m, and you take as an initial wave packet a Gaussian, so pi, pi sigma is normalization, minus 1 half, oh, 1 half, OK. Well, uh, sigma is the, sig the width of this wave packet at the time 0. And if you take a, a realistic thing of mass of an electron, 10 to the minus 30 kilogram, and sigma 1 angstrom, that means 10 to the minus 8 meter. and um, you compute the thing at a later time, you find that this looks very simple. Sigma t. Well, let us take just the, the square root of this. And <coughs> Do you need sigma square? Or? Yeah, I take sigma square here. And, uh, yeah, so minus 1 exponent of x squared over 2 sigma t squared. 
squared. And here it's also sigma squared. And the sigma of t is the square root of 1 plus h bar t squared over m squared sigma 0, 4 uh, times the sigma of 0. And that means that if I take those things here, this localization, then I'm one find, for instance, at uh, <coughs> well, uh, sigma of one second is equal to 10 to the 6 meter, which is ridiculous for our world, right? Because we know that our world is the chair and such things don't change. And this has something very fundamental to do with also the functioning of the brain, that decoherence helps to uh, localize things. And the idea goes back to C and yours. And it's, uh, the, the picture they use is they take a particle and a massive particle at the position x, that is the positional degree of freedom, and you have an initial, initial scattering particle to it, and it goes back into a sigma of o chi of x. Then the uh, formula of non-relativistic quantum mechanics tell you how to describe such a thing if you suppose that the range of this uh, potential which uh, represents the particle is short and uh, you think the idea is that the scattering s of the product state uh, can in a good approximation be written as something here and here, a chi of x. That means you get here an entanglement between the particle and the scattered particle. Uh, the important thing is now the following. If you take a density matrix, which is of the form dx, dx, prime and <coughs> row of the system, which is the particle here, um, <coughs> at x, x prime and 0 times the, if you want to have an operator here, x, x prime. And here, the initial, you take the initial wave function normalized to 1. And then the one is interested in looking at the row of the system at later time, or here the time actually plays no role in this image of a scattering process in the interaction picture. Oh. And this can be written as in the following form that the row s of x, x prime, and 0 goes over into the <coughs> row s of x, x prime, 0. And now the ov overlap between the scattering states, here the, part, the position of x is variable, chi of x prime, chi of x. This is non-relativistic scattering theory. And so if one wants to see decoherence, that means the uh, loss of the non-trivial, non of the, the loss of the contributions for x significantly different from x prime, one has to look at how this function here behaves. And the, the scattering theory leads you, after some assumptions, the assumptions are uh, that uh, 
this already is here, that there is no recoil and uh, the rate of scattering is much faster than the rate of change of the system state and distribution um, of the particles which scatter here around is isotropic. You, you get a differential equation. This is rho sigma x prime t by dt is equal to minus a function of x minus x prime of rho s of x, x prime and t. And the f can be computed explicitly. Let me just describe two ext extreme uh, cases. One is that the wavelength of the incoming particles is short. So the short length yeah. you find that the f of x, x prime is actually or a good approximation the total cross-section. So you see that there is an, of course, for x different x prime. And uh, this is a very rapid decay of co the correlations and, and the long range. You get that the f can be written in the form f of minus lambda if you take, for instance, x minus x prime equals to delta x. This plays now a role. Uh, and here it gets delta x squared. And so you get a t of delta x, which is here in the order of 1. The lambda can be explicitly expressed in terms of coordinates. The lambda is dq rho of q v of q q squared over h bar squared my sigma an effective cross section and the effective cross section at, at q is almost like the, the, uh, the square of the uh, <coughs> of the scattering function and here the important thing is that this here is then expressed in lambda and in delta x squared in this form and allows you in in a framework which, uh, which we trust, which is known as the quantum mechanics, what a s such a scattering a decay in coherence, because you see this goes here in, into the differential equation and gives a decay of the coherence. What it means, for instance, in the example which is in the textbook is tau delta x, for instance, is of the order of 10 to the minus 17 seconds for delta x for a large molecule, say, of 10 angstrom. And that is very impressive. And it tells us much about the reality of the world in which we live. Right? We, we are living because our senses are not made really for taking into account photon correlations and all kinds of things. But we are seeing uh, macroscopic parameters. And uh, for macroscopic parameters, you, uh, you can forget about the non-diagonal elements in this formula. That means the position is a very good coordinate of a massive object. <laughs> OK, so it, what has it to do with quantum mechanics? The important thing for quantum mechanics is that Techmark has estimated decoherence processes by scattering in a neuron. And the image of a neuron is realistic for this case. He's looking at a piece of the axon. 
the axon, for instance, has uh, non-isolated uh, parts and the known uh, node of Ranvier, on which you have potential differences due to concentration differences of ions. And then you can look at, for instance, at scattering between the ions and delocalize the ions, or inside or between the membrane. And for those things, uh, the tagmark values are, they don't fall really very, I will make a sooner remark, uh, into this framework without some ha hand waving. But uh, if you take a neuron and you have a colliding ion, you find that the T is 10 to, according to his estimates, 10 to the minus 20 second, which I think is a little bit too high, but it's enormous. Uh, and if you take a colliding ions with water, you get the same value approximate. If you take values be between the ions inside and outside of a membrane, uh, you get only 10 to the minus 19 seconds. And if you look at structures which uh, are fashionable in biology, like microtubules, which are objects in the cell body for structural stability, you find also decoyance times, which are very short. But longer than this one, 10, 10 to the 13, according to Tickmark's estimate. Now, let me just make a criticism to, this, to those formulae. Of course, I believe that the coherence is very strong. But it would be really nice to have a, a very good and mathematical theory of that decoherence in, in, in the brain or in the network of neurons. And all those estimates are not really rigorous, but orders of magnitude. And uh, a mathematical mind should, of course, attack those things. And uh, one could give, give mathematical models of decoherence where you can prove theorems about, but they have very little to do with the brain. I mean, one example which uh, uh, Sidney Coleman and I discussed, and I will not go into it too much in detail, is the following. You take an Hamiltonian, which is H0 plus H system, and uh, you take as H0 P only. That means a translation in the time, and you take as let me call it v, v equals sum n from 1 to infinity of v function minus n, and here sigma 1 n, and you take the usual Pauli matrices, sigma 3 equals 1 minus 1, and sigma 1 equals to 1 1, and you take a the example of a particle, an electron, which, whose spin, which is related to the coordinate zero, the eigenvalues of zero, one, whose spin is measured by having the electron going along an array of spins and interacting during the flight of the electron in this uh, line uh, with a potential which has compact support. And the important thing is that you assume that the integral minus infinity to plus infinity of Vxx is equal to pi over 2. And you know that e to the i pi over 2 times uh, applied to sigma 1 it gives the rotation about 180 degrees. Uh, so if you take s such a case, and if you take, for instance, a particle wave function of uh, compact support, uh, 
and the V also of compact support, then you can easily estimate the uh, de decoherence which the flight of this particle produces along this line. Here you can really analyze the process in terms, not in scattering theory where you relate two sorts of asymptotic states, but in, in real time. And you can see, for instance, what type of decoherence occurs if a particle only moves along this line up to the point n. I mean, the t comes in here because of the h0. The important thing is the following. If you take the Dyson equation, one minus i zero t ds, v of s times u of s, and uh, you take v of s equal to e to the i h0 times s v e to the minus e i. And because of the special form of this relativistic law of propagation, p and not p squared, you, you see that this thing here is just the sum n from 1 to infinity. And here, v of x plus s minus t minus, excuse me, my e x plus s minus n, the parameter which occurs here. And uh, if you compute the u of t in this form, and you see that the u of t is e equal to exponent of minus i integral 0 t ds and sum v x plus s minus n, sum over n. And the important thing is sigma. sigma from oh. I'm very grateful. <laughs> okay, this comes already. Yeah, you have the sigma one here, and the t here is. And so. Uh, what it says is the following, for instance, if you take this as a support of, of this chi in the minus 1, 1, and, and you take v also in the support of minus 1, 1, and then you can see that if you take the, the time evolution and the interaction picture, which is nothing happens. Yeah. Yeah. If you take as a time evolution thing, nothing happens if a particle is in a positive plus p minus times u of t, then you can see that. If I follow the time evolution from an initial state, which is yeah, if I take as an initial state psi plus or minus uh, eigenstates of When, and an initial state with wave function of, of the electron tensor the psi plus or minus. And if I take v 
be the product state of this thing with the measurement apparatus. And here, for instance, times tensor n from 1 to infinity of the phi plus. And those are eigenstates where all the spins are up. The picture is very simple, that the upper state, which is not affected by the time evolution, uh, keeps the, the spins up of the apparatus, while the time evolution of the other one goes up to an n, which depends on, on time. I'm taking times a uh, multiple of n, where those spins are turned down and the remainder turned up. And this thing pr moves to infinity. And so you see, you can fix constants to be more realistic, that in such a uh, model of decoherence, you can see how rapidly the overlap disappears between the two states, even if you took arbitrary operators between the two. And you can also take coherent superpositions of two such states. And for all practical purposes, that means for all uh, measurements which you do in finite region of space on the spin system, you find that a coherent superposition of such two initial states is equal to incoherent one, because you have those observables at infinity. Uh, and uh, in the limit t going to, or n going to infinity, you have a perfect disjointness of the two, two states. This is a trivial <laughs> theorem, uh, but it shows you that decoherence can actually be something really uh, strong. Uh, it is the states which you obtain after the process of decoherence can never be coherently superposed in any representation of suitable C star algebra. And that's, of course, something which for a measurement process of which we like in uh, physics is much too strong. But you can get, get such strong things. And uh, it shows that probably a future decoherence theory of the brain uh, would lead to similar results. Uh, it, the processes, in the, if you take the brain as a measurement op operator, <laughs> it makes the decoherence of inputs extremely rapidly and also extremely strongly in the sense of quantum mechanics. You have no hope in getting quantum physics in the brain according to such a hand-waving argument. But the uh, situation is much more interesting because, well, I want to speak about first that quantum mechanics does not improve higher brain functions. And the second topic, if I have time, that consciousness does not demystify quantum mechanics. Now, let's come to the first part and let's rapidly go through some pictures of the brain so you can see that, uh, about what I'm speaking about. I, the brain is built out of neurons. And the neurons are connected by synapses. And they have a very uh, detailed uh, connectivity via uh, the synapses and the boutons and so. And all those things, the structural things, have been elucidated by neurobiology. The, um, if one wants to re relate structure with function, one could look at a higher brain function, uh, which you all know very well as uh, readers, the eye movements of, uh, between readers. Or on re and the eye movements along a text, for instance, uh, a text with a Morse code to have a simple form, uh, are the, the eye moves in steps forward by saccades. And sometimes at the end of a line, it re resumes. Uh, 
the position along a one-dimensional line of text and you, uh, during the text it can also skip a word and, and analyze several words at a time. Now the important thing is that both things are the, the both processes are represented in a time uh, in the brain in a very distributed form. Uh, the saccades, for instance, are generated by the frontal eye field, and the motor control, uh, the, motor co the motor control, is down here in the brain stem. So there is a direct projection of the frontal eye fields into the brain stem, which activates the, the eye muscles, and you have the vision, which is necessary for uh, analyzing the picture, the lines, and so in the visual cortex. And they, this is here in the hind brain, in the, the posterior part of the cerebral cortex. So in, if you want to make a minimal model in neuroelectrodynamics of circuits which generate reading saccades according to visual patterns here, you would need some higher order visual areas which have analyzed the Morse code, send it as an input to the frontal eye field. The frontal eye field is a complex circuit uh, of which is dedicated to saccades of different sizes and let's take it one dimensional. And in this local circuit you generate from the visual input, a motor output. Now, this is part of a model which, uh, which we have actually done in, in detail. And uh, let me just describe what it is. If your frontal eye field is a, a local eye and the frontal eye field uh, gets input from the visual cortex for visual selection, it gets input for fixation because between, of, between saccades the eye should not move. But from the visual selection which is done in this area, uh, you should, uh, plus attention, you should generate the output if the fixation is uh, cancelled, if the eye is allowed to, to, to move. And, uh, <laughs> We, we have impl implemented such a circuit for, for 21 eye positions, plus minus 10 and 0, in, uh, in po populations which are for every eye position or visual, visual pos position fairly large, 100 neurons. And so, so the whole network of this thing has more than 10,000 neurons. And, uh, it can be, this is the structure of a local connectivity. The visual input comes in into the, uh, an area which generates from the visual input an attentional signal which is transformed into a motor signal and goes down into areas which actually change the rules of uh, eye movements because you can also make other eye movements than just reading. You have a local connectivity time more or less statistically, you have populations of hundreds of neurons and you generate uh, connections with a certain uh, synaptic weight. For which model is this data? For which model is it? It's so huge, right? Because you look at the neurons. But for which model is this data? Take? We are taking the data from the uh, neurophysiology. No, no, specifically from each animal, from each data. Yes. Because no, we, we by pure and read, and pure and mechanism reading is very different from other the saccadic eye movements are, have been very well studied but by. The reading is very specific. Yes. You know, if, for example, this dyslexia, specific to human disease, yeah, you cannot study it on animals. And at least saccadic eye movements don't depend on reading for any kind of visual process. The yes. reading is special. So I'm asking if specifically for reading, but you're talking, or general vision. It is, in a sense, for general vision. And it's just the vision of moving the eye along a line or so, which monkey could also do if he gets a re reward. No, but, but, but the but vision is very specific. Yes. I mean, the specificity of, of vision, of reading, very different. Monkey. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's monkey. 
Yes. No, but man cannot eat. Yes. So, man has specific making in human brain, specifically for eating, not for any other vision. And this very small part of the, of the cortex, very, very small, it's one millimeter square. It's very tiny. It has very little to do with the rest of the visual cortex. And so, so I'm subjecting reading. You can go around the lines and mark it, but reading is a very special process. Yes. So, let me try to answer it. Uh, we are st studying the eye movements which are necessary for reading. And the monkey can be trained on making those eye movements and get a reward. But of course the monkey would not read in our sense that if a Morse code, for instance, has a meaning for us. And so this is from higher areas about which our model says nothing. So reading is really re reading eye movements. And I'm only speaking about those things where we can... So reading is metaphoric. In a sense, yes. metaphoric, metaphoric, yes. Okay. yes. And uh, the data which we are losing, using is for the synaptic circuit which goes here. We are using data from the visual cortex of... Oh, let, let me go back. We are looking at connectivity between neurons which have been experimentally determined in primary visual cortex and so. So we take a model of the synaptic circuit and we take for the patterns of eye movements the electrophysiological data of the monkey. And if one does such things then one can fairly... one can apply rules of electrodynamics. One has a neural connectivity diagram for between, say, a neuron, an excited story and an inhibitory neuron interact with each other with, with weights W, B, A and I, B. You get external inputs in, in different forms. You, you get from the external, uh, from the, the text, so to speak, B, G external. And you get also uh, noise inputs uh, for each neuron's excitatory and inhibitory ones. Those are parameters which we uh, specified. And uh, we take a, a dynamics, which is a stochastic differential equation. Uh, the, the neurons are described by a potential, V of t, which uh, describes the, the level of activation of the neuron. And this is given by uh, inputs, excitatory and in, inhibitory inputs. We have conductances which change external conductances which change according to, uh, this is a, <coughs> this is an Ulbeck process which has a certain noise level and certain uh, driving. And the important thing is that the connectivity in this ne network we try to fix as much as possible by anatomy. And if one solves those differential equations on a laptop, one is very happy because... This is stochasticity, which variables are random in this differential equation. Both, this thing is random. This thing here has... Oh, it's uh, yeah. the equations for the G, which are... Yes, I see. So the connections, in a sense, are deterministic, but the, their input on for different levels is random. And what I only want to stress here is that you can actually fit the functional behavior of such a reading network, for instance, in forward movements and in backward movements by measuring the activities of different neuronal populations in the circuit. So the circuit implements in neuroelectrodynamics, so to speak, a part of the problem which we have to have a fitting. More than three? We have <laughs> hundreds if you wish. And we can fit everything there. Uh, no, not not quite. I mean we want to respect the anatomy. That's one thing. So the connections are not arbitrary. And the second thing is we want to uh, reproduce the electrophysiology in the monkey where one has determined the firing patterns of different neuronal populations in saccadic tasks, for instance. And that's a rich 
field of data. And of course, we have not a unique solution. We actually we throw dice by taking any uh, representation of a random process and also by, ever, by taking any can connectivity which we can throw by dice uh, between different areas where we only describe how many, what the proportion is of excited neurons of one going to the other. But uh, this is not the, the topic of my talk. The topic of my talk is that in such a piece of brain, which is classical, stochastic ordinary differential equations, does not use quantum mechanics at all, one can with uh, <laughs> sufficient determination reproduce higher brain functions uh, and the monkey has already a very complex task by moving the eyes along a line and one could in principle think that one can actually ex understand reading as reading with not moving the eyes but also understanding syntax and semantics of the text also in terms of such classical models. And that's an ongoing piece of research with, which is done in uh, uh, neurobiology. In computational neuroscience, we, we made um, Heinzle and uh, Kevin Martin and I made this model as one of those typical models of which contain detailed structure. But uh, we the physicists actually are speculating very strongly about other possibilities of bringing quantum mechanics in a meaningful way into the brain, not by such models like uh, the CEO's model of scattering of, <laughs> of ions with ions and such things, but uh, taking into account structures and structures which are biologically meaningful. Let me describe a piece of structure which, is, which has been extremely well studied in uh, biology, and which is photosynthesis. And in the photosynthesis, in very simple things, that in, in bacteria, you find uh, a chemical structure which uh, has three pieces, an antenna which takes the photos into account, a reaction center which is deep in the molecule and you have uh, the so-called FMO protein which is a trimer and in each trimer you find chlorophylls which are centers for excitation and for transfer of excitation. And the biologists have studied the, this process because it has also a great importance for for life and future uh, technology and ask the question is the transport of excitation from the antenna to the reaction center a classical or a quantum mechanical process and if it's quantum mechanical is it useful for photosynthesis those are two different things I mean it's clear quantum mechanics is foundational for for the brain, but whether quantum mechanics contributes something or not, for instance, for the very efficient transfer of excitation from the antenna to the reaction center is a different question. And uh, the answer is very interesting. Uh, let me just write it because it can be written in terms of formula, which you again like, like those things here. The, the model which is studied in this case is the following. You take a Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian of the system plus a Hamiltonian of the bath, plus an interaction system bath. And you take, for the system, you take the excited or the ground states of each of those molecules. And one thinks that one models those molecules by two level systems again and one uh, so one takes here for the different levels if you have, have n uh, n of those chlorophylls you 
will take and here take En plus I different from J. Coupling constants J I J I J. A very simple uh, hop, hopping Hamiltonian. And uh, the second thing which one does is one takes as above bosons and one takes for each chlorophyll, one takes an independent bath. So one takes here the sum over the j from 1 to n. And for each j, one takes an index kappa for the bath. And here one takes a p j kappa squared over 2 m j kappa plus 1 half m kappa mj kappa omega j kappa squared q j kappa squared. And uh, as an interaction, one takes the, the form that, um, let me try. Takes not a constant here, but take an uh -huh. I. This is true. But for the interaction, one takes system bath, linear coupling, sum over J from 1 to N, J. J, uj, and with uj is an operator linear in the above operators. The uj is uh, minus sum of a kappa g j kappa q j kappa, and both are the position coordinates of the above. So this is a type of Hamiltonian which one studies very often in condensed matter physics. And uh, how does one deal now with the photoelectric effect? One takes rho of 0, it takes a rho of the system times the rho of a bath. And here for the rho of a bath, one takes a thermal, a thermal bath. And so, the uj, for instance, t1, it's a Gaussian state, and so the two-point function is alone necessary. 2, 2 is equal, well, it's written as alpha of t1 minus t2. And it is expressed in terms of the, the spectral function of this bath. And so the alpha j of t is integral from 0 to infinity. And here's the spectral function, which, is, which I have not given here in, in detail. But it comes in here from, from this form, from the coupling. Um, uj of omega. And here, cotangents hyperbolic of beta h omega over 2 cos omega t minus e sine omega t. So it is a well, well studied form of an interaction which you can now study in the uh, interaction picture. And the original work goes back to Kubo. And it leads in, the, in the literature, in physical chemistry, it leads to the hierarchical the one calls it high, high EOM equations. You, in order to make the equations well defined, you have to do, do something about the 
time dependence of this two point function. I mean, the end point functions are given by products of lower point functions. Uh, and what one does is one makes for alpha of t a party ex expansion. Uh, so kappa from 1, in principle to infinity, but one takes a cutoff here uh, on p j kappa times e to the minus gamma j kappa t. If one makes such an ex expansion, then one can, I mean, if you're looking at the uh, interaction picture equations of motion for the reduced density matrices in this form here, uh, you see that uh, they are no, no, not local in time. But if you take one of those components here and take the exponential, then you get localization in time. You get an infinite or finite if you have n uh, chlorophylls and you have k different uh, party approximates. You get such a, a system with a hierarchy of such equations, which you can solve. And actually, in this form, or if you take a finite cutoff here, you get a differential equation, a linear differential equation, t dot t, for this whole system now of this tower here is equal to some operator O times t, and you can integrate both equations of motion. So what, what is the, the gist of the story? The gist of the story is one of the most complicated and interesting processes in physics of life can be, at, at least approximately, connected to a formula in statistical mechanics. And one can look, for instance, at the following question. If you take this molecule here, and you take just those uh, chlorophylls which are carrying the excitation, uh, how does the excitation move? Well, this comes from chemical structure. If you take those seven chlorophyll molecules, then you could, for instance, the initial, here's the initial condition going in from the system, uh, can be different according to what kind of excitation you give. And one of the forms which are suggested by chemistry is that you excite either the one, and then you see how the excitation moves around, or you excite the, the, the six, the reaction center is close to those two chlorophyll mole molecules. And then you can look at the quantum mechanics of those things, because those are still quantum mechanical operators. And what the numerical calculations lead you to is that you can get, you get a reduced density matrix, which has coherences in it, which you can entanglement for the different processes. For instance, if you excite one, you get one sort of entanglements, or if you excite six, you get another sort of entanglements. So quantum mechanics, in a sense, can be seen in the solution of the chemical equations. But are the chemical equations really the reality? And uh, one finds spectroscopically that there are coherences in the molecules. And from such a model, actually, in terms of such a model, you can analyze the chemical picture. And the statement of the authors is it gives a good approximation for the chemical picture. This is because you say what kind of experiments spectroscopy, you say, spectroscopy of what? Oh, it's, it's, it's very brutal. You have sequences of laser pulses, uh, which and you have different time intervals between the laser pulses, and you excite the mo model by the sequence of laser pulses, and then you get from the spectrum, uh, from the Fourier transform of the spectrum, you get distributions of peaks. I, let me stay. The whole of the molecule, how many actually excited gas? It's just one excited state, or maybe have two of what, how many? Go on, boy, because I don't know. When you excite the laser, it may have to go to one. Oh, 
actually it, it has if you take uh, just try to restrict it here in terms of the uh, the states of this of this monomer i mean you let me come back uh, because you have three monomers if you take only one monomer you have n two level atoms and those two n uh, actually you have n atoms which can be excited also to very higher energies but one makes the approximation but only the ground state and the next higher one is meaningful that's in, in terms of this model and then it, it, and actually one does the following one takes as his initial state the one where all the and so you know exactly about one over the one electron void how much it is how much is the gap it's one one electron volt approximately i can't give you the exact number it's like really, really light yeah it's about one electron volt I believe. yeah i mean it's in the literature but i don't know no it's not easy because with the chemistry that destruction yeah so the yeah. question is of how much to go to lower energy yeah and since it's about 25. i could look it up but i don't know the precise number yeah yeah that's it oh Okay, so I can. <laughs> David. It was not clear to me what gets entangled with what and in which way the quantum mechanics is tested in the experiment. I mean, what kind of typically quantum effect can you see in the experiment? Okay. Some interference or what? For, for me personally, not a very strong person. You just take a density matrix, a due density matrix, which you can compute in this model and you can see that we made this that there's a coherence for instance between the non-diagonal matrix which which, which which means it's very yeah. 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 so yeah. 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 the point so is that it is an experiment indicating that i think the only because experimental diagnosis or there are some oscillation in the coherence i mean there are different uh, definitions of what one takes as a coherence. Let's take a, this is the so-called total coherence, which has something to do with the entropy of the state. And then you can look at different coherences in time for different initial excitations and also for different initial temperatures. Because what's interesting here is that this can be studied either by a very low temperature, minus 77 here in this case, or by a room te temperature. And one finds coherences which oscillate, and so what? Now, what really is interesting is what is the transfer of energy from the excited chlorophyll to the reaction center, and not such quantum mechanical coherences, which are visible. Now, the story in this case is very sad. First of all, the story is that one has forgotten one of the monomers. There is another monomer very close to the antenna, which one calls seven, eight. No, from one to the, here one has from one to seven, and one has an eight, and one, in the equations which are very general, one could study the same model with, a, with eight, chlorophylls in one monomer. But then one can also study the interaction between the different monomers that gives A times 3, 24 uh, reaction center. And those equations are of the same structure, only with different constants. If one takes into account all the constants which one can measure from physical chemistry, one finds that the model which people have analyzed here and for which they have said quantum mechanics has a functional role in both things, actually uh, does not say the right thing. Because one can look at a classical theory where you have just hopping between the different states here with constants which are given by detailed panels and so, and you find that this hopping model does just the same thing for the transfer of energy. So, the conclusion, I think, <laughs> for me, unfortunately, only one third of my talk, and I will not give more. Uh, the conclusion is uh, quantum mechanics in this case also does not really play a functional role. 
of course you can see because you have chemistry and if you have excitations which you can uh, you can excite the model at different parts and you find coherences and that's thing. The, the question whether the light transfer in this case here if you take the fu a fuller model into account uh, disappears. Now the second part of my talk was actually intended to speak where does consciousness help something to enter quantum mechanics yeah yeah so uh, i can just uh, go very fast to to one thing so first of all it is the following that yeah i put this down yeah. so the first statement which one can make now from neurobiology now it's human human biology is that uh, you have to dis distinguish different forms of consciousness and there is a form which one calls access consciousness there are pre-conscious processes occur and when the level of uh, excitation <laughs> is high enough they become conscious and you can ask the person do you see something or don't you see something and one has found several interesting cases where higher order higher brain functions are processed unconsciously if the excitation is too, too low for instance syntax in, in a language model uh, and uh, but on the other hand the model can also models of this consciousness where one takes to into account dn for instance here in paris has a very interesting model a neural network model again uh, a workspace which gets where more and more states and regions get uh, activated and beyond the threshold which one called, could call the non-equilibrium phase transition you find conscious processes which in the model are just access to different functions again uh, for instance, in a language model, one would not only analyze a syntactic error in a sequence of words, but one could also ask for questions of semantic error and so. And in this distributed network of a brain, you can see at what level syntax and semantics get coupled and so. So one has a, an. an, an qualitative and, and model based and analysis of one part of consciousness which is called access consciousness and then another form of consciousness of course is self-consciousness and also there one has at least a qualitative picture that in you could there are neuronal populations in the brain which one calls mirror neurons which are activated not by a monkey performing a task, but also by the monkey looking at an experiment performing the task. And it is clear that higher forms of consciousness can be modeled by not only by simulating the, the experimenter in the brain of the monkey, but simulating ourselves. That means one uh, by a recurrence in the loop of higher order sensory processes. Now if one takes this qualitative picture into account, one could also say, well, we, we, can, uh, we can speak about consciousness on several levels. And, and we could work out those models more carefully. But does this consciousness help us for understanding quantum mechanics? Now the, here comes an interesting question. The, the question is, is the will free or not? Now, if we take the uh, account from those consciousness experiments about free will, one is very much, at least I am convicted, that we have no free will. And so, for the interpretation. What does that actually mean? Yes. I never understand these yeah. About yeah. I, I, I think it's just for the tea time. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, let me state in the, in, the, in the end here, there's a wonderful theorem by Cochin and Conway 
about the free will theorem. But it takes into, as one of the assumptions that the experimenter has free access of choosing its uh, apparatus and so. And then the sta statement, which is a mathematical statement, says the quantum mechanics has the same type of free will which an experimenter has. If one introduces conscious free will in this theorem. Now, if we don't have consciousness free will, but have a deterministic free will, this theorem is empty. Let me just uh, go to T now with you. <laughs> Do we have time for a short question? Yeah, so you have. Uh, okay. Yeah, so in, can one summarize one of these sentences? Yeah. Your opinion about the role of the observer of consciousness in quantum mechanics. Yeah. So my, my view is that the, the brain is a sophisticated organ like others, and they are determined by microscopic laws, yeah. which. Uh, If you take the macroscopic description seriously, you also have to take seriously that conscious decisions are based on prior knowledge of the system, learning and such things. And all those poses play a role. For instance, if you take this free will theorem in the way an experimenter would like to measure the spin one, for instance, in one direction or the other. So he has a strategy developed by uh, learning and by outside stimuli, but over a long time, which makes that the system behaves deterministically. That's my feeling. But nobody can prove anything. Uh, what would be your quantum description of the world now? Now being never the same on the land. On yes. The, the yes, I don't give any, any uh, special importance to now. If I take the brain in terms of equations of neurodynamics. But now is the is world in the natural language? Yes, yes, yes. But this, I don't, I can't explain. This is something of, of our lexicon. We, but it, it is clear that in time, time is in this neuroelectrodynamical model of the brain, a parameter, the states change in time. And so if I take T0, it is the now, the now at times T0. I, I'm, I'm conscious <laughs> about the fact that many philosophers take very seriously the importance of the now and so, but they put meaning into the now, which I can't see in those models and in the description. Yes, I last remember, question. No, it is a very question, so I remember reading there are some books of generals where he speaks about, in particular, the microtubules in the brain, some are related to some quantum things, but I don't remember exactly. He also mentioned some experiments which he called the Libet experiments, which give some strange thing about the, about the timing in the brain. Do you have any comments on this? Yes, I have, but it takes a longer time. The yeah, the, quest, the question is the following. <laughs> Libet does an experiment where one uh, presses an arrow, and at time zero, for instance, a movement is, and one measures the activity of the brain which builds up during this time before. So here's negative times. And one sees that the, the brain decides consciously about moving or not moving at a certain time which, before, which is before the time where the movement is actually executed. And this can be determined by different forms now, not only by the experimental looking at the watch and so on, telling when it is. But one can also look at the cellular behavior of neurons in the premotor cortex and so. At least one sees that the build up of this thing precedes sometimes many seconds before actually we are conscious or the person is conscious about the movement. And this is again one of the arguments against free will. I mean, the con at least conscious free will will not de determine the movement because the movement is already built up in the network. But 
Yeah. I've seen it somewhere in the internet, or someone who suggests, it, well, roughly, that a conscious decision yeah. uh, uh, collapses the wave function before, oh. that is, that there is some backward thing, I don't know, some, yeah. Yeah. some physicist could yes. have yeah. some theory yeah. about yeah. this, and do you have yes. any comment on this kind of... I can say, <laughs> that's a dirty word about it, about the net, yes. And, uh, and uh, Hamarov and Penrose have built a model on the influence of gravitational collapse uh, in the smallest on uh, the reduction of a wave bucket. And I did not speak about it, but they also have non-causal propagation of time, that you, the time moves forward and backwards in their model, and, and I can't understand it. But uh, Mr. Thibault can understand, but maybe... Let's thank the speaker again.